First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to speak uh, in this important symposium. Uh, I would like to express my regrets for not being able to come uh, myself and present in front of you uh, because of some personal unexpected reasons. And I still uh, really like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak through virtual medium. The title of my presentation is Because Culture Cannot Wait. And I've titled this uh, presentation such uh, because I think we generally forget that in post-disaster response and recovery, uh, it is not just saving lives of uh, affected people and looking at their uh, assets and livelihoods uh, and shelter, but uh, the importance of cultural heritage uh, just cannot be overlooked. And it has as important a role to play in, in uh, long-term sustainability of communities after disaster, and this consideration must be given in the immediate aftermath of any uh, disaster. Cultural heritage, tangible and intangible, movable and immovable, is unfortunately becoming increasingly vulnerable to disasters and conflict. And this is shown very clearly through recent examples such as this devastating earthquake that happened in Nepal earlier this year, uh, where two big shocks and many aftershocks in April and May have really jolted uh, not only uh, the physical fabric of the, uh, of the place, uh, of many villages, of many settlements, but also has uh, the cultural heritage, the rich, very rich heritage of Nepal has suffered tremendously because of this disaster. Here's another example of immense damage which was caused to national archives following Iraq war in 2003. And this brings me to this issue of not just looking at natural events or natural disasters, but also looking at human-induced events, uh, especially conflict situations, which unfortunately we uh, are becoming more and more uh, predominant uh, in the present times. And this is illustrated by this example, uh, where uh, Ninva Museum in Mosul in Iraq has been destroyed uh, also by, by the militants. Uh, and then in Hatra in Iraq, uh, cultural heritage has suffered immense destruction because of the same reason. And we find that these kind of conflicts are taking increasing toll on cultural heritage every in, in many parts of the world. This is another example of destruction of mosque in Aleppo, Syria. Uh, we know that Aleppo is badly damaged now uh, following the civil war that is ongoing there. And also more and more cultural heritage is increasingly targeted in, the, in that region. So, do we as custodians of heritage respond to these alarming natural and human-induced threats? This is a vital question that we must think and try and understand how can we answer it. Let's look at some of the encouraging examples where which tell us how this can be how we can help in such situation. Uh, after the civil unrest in Egypt uh, there was one of the unfortunate event was the attack on the uh, National Museum in Cairo. And, and very uh, interestingly, it was only the residents of Cairo who ba made a human chain and tried, tried very hard and succeeded to a great extent in protecting uh, the museum from getting looted and damaged uh, during that difficult uh, unrest situation. This brings me to an important initiative that has been uh, launched uh, by ICROM uh, and also with support of organizations such as ICOMOS uh, and, and especially its International Scientific Committee on Risk Preparedness, ICORP, uh, which is titled as First Aid to Cultural Heritage in Complex Emergencies. Now, first aid, I have already explained, is important because we would like to respond uh, to heritage just like any first aider will do to human lives. And complex emergencies 
uh, we want to s we want to emphasize on that uh, dimension because it is not just earthquake or flood or fire but increasingly we find that disasters are increasingly very complex they are multi hazard they are not just connected to one hazard such as earthquake but there are many things that come together which create uh, complex situations also when we find that many of these areas which are prone to natural disasters are also uh, very much conflict prone areas therefore if we have to undertake appropriate first aid then we really need to consider all the situations that may arise uh, in such contexts one of the initiative that ecomos in cooperation with ecrom and dgam uh, the department of culture in syria undertook was a ecomos e-learning course for the protection of syria's cultural heritage in times of conflict in january and august 2013 this was one of the first initiatives that was undertaken to give some kind of basic training to heritage managers from both sites and museums and uh, to so that they know how what they can do minimum minimum uh, extent to to save heritage in case of conflict or uh, emergency situation so in this uh, case uh, experts from around the world came together and gave uh, lectures uh, very basic lectures on first aid response to uh, these heritage site managers who were all collected together uh, in Damascus Museum and the internet was used to its maximum benefit uh, for undertaking such an e-learning course. UNESCO office uh, in Beirut has been undertaking many such initiatives recently uh, which include training of Syrian heritage professionals in emer emergency response for cultural heritage. I will now speak about the 7.8 magnitude earthquake and the 7.4 magnitude earthquakes in Nepal in April and May earlier this year which caused immense damage to cultural heritage and I will take this example to illustrate what kind of challenges we face when we deal with first aid to cultural heritage especially in developing countries. I will also use this opportunity to explain the initiatives that could be undertaken through uh, through organization, uh, through coordination between national and international organizations. So first, let's look at the kind of damage that occurred uh, following this uh, these devastating earthquakes. So many world heritage sites got badly damaged. As you see here, this is in Bhaktapur world heritage site in in Kathmandu Valley, and the temples were badly damaged. This is uh, another world heritage site of Anuman Toka in Kathmandu, again, and here you can see on the left side the the tower uh, before the earthquake and following the earthquake, uh, most of those upper stories had collapsed and a and lot of uh, damage had happened and several lives were also lost. It was not only historic building but also museums that were housed in this uh, important uh, he uh, heritage site uh, that suffered because of this earthquake and many of the collections including the throne of the first king of Nepal which were trapped in the rubble and in damaged, severely damaged buildings, as you can see in this picture. Another big challenge that uh, that was faced following the this disaster was uh, the that many communities uh, were not sure whether their buildings were safe or not safe, and therefore, even if there was not big damage. To the to the temples or to any heritage structure as you would see on the left side the community themselves with the help of local uh, craftsmen started dismantling these temples and starting to keep them suit because they were they thought that if they would left leave these buildings as such uh, they would get more damaged and also they were scared of theft 
uh, from these buildings and you can see on the right uh, on the right side that this temple has been completely dismantled uh, and and has been stored as i would show you in the next image so here you see the storage of those salvage temple fragments but the, then you notice that there is no skill in how to dismantle how to store these fragments how to keep them safe because when these have to be reconstructed uh, when the situation is right and when the resources are available it would be very difficult to to do that process because uh, because of the lack of documentation and clear methodology in in dismantling and also a lot of damage could have happened because of the the way these are stored and in fact uh, one could see that uh, they were exposed to rainfall and they were already seeing we were already seeing a kind of damage to many of these fragments uh, when we saw them a few weeks later this was another uh, big issue that was faced uh, following the uh, disaster that uh, people especially the engineers and uh, the the local uh, contractors didn't have the knowledge of shoring these heritage structures in the right way there were no uh, there was no prior knowledge on how to do this kind of uh, shoring properly or temporary stabilization properly and therefore they were just putting these uh, uh, wooden uh, logs just to make sure just to feel that they are protecting but in real sense uh, the, the technically there were lot of problems in the way shoring was done also uh, one should emphasize here the importance of civic defense that's army and police because they were the ones who were really trying to salvage or take out all the heritage structures uh, heritage fragments but these people didn't have any prior knowledge or training on how to rescue heritage objects and this was increasingly uh, a challenge there because many of them uh, were doing uh, with all good intentions they were trying to salvage these uh, objects and fragments but uh, they didn't because of lack of knowledge uh, there was a big challenge in how to really keep them in safe way for future use a lot of them were being dismantled in a very uh, in not in a proper way we also found the strong role that community volunteers can play uh, but and here as you see that uh, the local community women from the local communities are trying to uh, trying to salvage uh, bricks and store them in a proper way uh but the problem that was faced was a uh, lack of coordination of these volunteers with heritage agencies municipality and civic defense agencies so all these different stakeholders were doing their own bit to the best possible way in the best possible manner but there was lack of coordination among them and this resulted sometimes in duplication of efforts and sometimes in actually uh uh long long much longer time in doing things than would have been possible if there was a greater coordination following this earthquake uh, international organizations such as ecomos ecrom icom and the smithsonian institution with the financial support of prince claus foundation came together we realized that we cannot work in isolation we all need to pull together our strengths uh, ecomos through its extensive work in conservation of historic buildings sites ecrom with its immense knowledge in capacity building icom uh, with its uh, ex experience in museums and also smithsonian institution uh, which has a great knowledge and experience in uh, objects management collections management Uh, they all came together and for the first time ever uh, worked together to do something to build the capacity of local stakeholders to undertake first aid to cultural heritage and prince claus foundation supported us also in this in undertaking this initiative 
many of us uh, were asked questions why we are talking about building the capacity at that critical moment after disaster when what was really required was to do something on ground. Our response was that in order to do something really on ground effectively, there needs to be an efficient capacity to undertake the job effectively. And therefore, a ground on ground training, a training which is not limited to classroom lectures, but something, a training that helps you to do things on the ground in an effective way using appropriate tools is really needed. And that's the reason why we all emphasize on building the capacity of local stakeholders so that they can effectively respond in saving cultural heritage that was already badly damaged due to the disaster. So one of the activities that we did was to train the military and police to salvage heritage and also to coordinate with heritage department and custodians of temples many of which were historic structures. So it is important in such situations to know who will do the job, to train army and police, and to coordinate between structural engineers to ensure safety of heritage structures so that those who go inside the buildings are not risking their lives while saving the objects. As part of our initiative, uh, we also did training of museum staff to salvage and store collections. This was very much needed because many of these staff were the ones who were going to do the job uh, and it was important to build their capacity to, to undertake uh, uh, proper ways of handling the collections, saving them, uh, packing them, documenting them, storing them. We also found that documentation and storage of salvage fragments for collapsed heritage buildings is an important issue that needs to be considered. Because all these fragments need to be put together and uh, brought back into re re restored buildings when the recovery starts. So if the documentation of these individual fragments is not undertaken properly, then the job of recovery of cultural heritage would become very, very difficult. And it is not easy because the, these fragments are in a, a very complex, are in, are, in, uh, are in big numbers, but still it is very important to, to really have a proper documentation system and the importance of having drawings uh, of structures, the original drawings of structures is also very important in such situations as, were real, as was realized here. Another important initiative that we undertook as, our, as a team of ECOMOS, ECROM, uh, ICOM and Smithsonian was to build capacity of young community volunteers in one of the traditional settlements to salvage and document heritage. In such situations, we cannot only rely on experts. We also have to rely on the true custodians of heritage, that is the local community. And we found that the local young youth members uh, were very willing to come and undertake such salvage operations because they realized the importance of these architectural fragments. So therefore, we targeted these young volunteers to train them on how to effectively save their uh, damaged fragments uh, and document them and then uh, keep them in the storage. Uh, it is important to mention here that everyone thought that these people are only concerned about their shelter because most of them had lost their houses. But when we interacted with them, we found that they were equally concerned about saving their heritage structures or fragments because they thought that these are the ones that are going to give identity to their reconstructed houses following the disaster. A big challenge that we found uh, was 
uh, how to balance religious needs and those of safety and re recovery. Many of these heritage structures are temples and uh, monasteries. And it was very important for, for the community to start uh, worshipping in these temples and monasteries as soon as possible. Now, how to enable that was a, a issue that had to be resolved. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it implied that we had to work very closely with religious leaders. And sometimes uh, religious needs uh, also didn't allow uh, the outsiders, the technical people, to come inside these structures and undertake thorough supervision, uh, thorough uh, uh, assessment, and in that, and therefore, uh, we had to train these religious leaders on undertaking the assessment. So it was very important for us to work very closely with them, and recognizing the constraints, we had to develop appropriate, easy ways of uh, doing this kind of damage assessment. Uh, we always think that damage assessment can be done by trained people with experts, but in real, real situation, we really need to work with, uh, with people who are not very well trained and have to give them very basic training in undertaking uh, assessment in order to uh, respond effectively. So relying on only on experts may not be a feasible option. Cultural recovery is crucial in Nepal. The challenge is how to build back better while retaining the tangible and intangible values. So an important challenge for us is to really strike a balance between safety, which of course cannot be compromised, but also retaining as much values, as many values as possible. Because having safety but sacrificing all those heritage values would really deprive this immense cultural resource of its uh, value that has helped it in getting inscribed on world heritage. I would like to say that uh, we should conclude by uh, recognizing that recovery of heritage is not just uh, about restoring built fabric. It is a means for psychological recovery through continuity of living traditions. And this fact must be recognized while we undertake post-disaster recovery. Because if we only recover uh, brick and mortar, but don't recover the attachment, the spiritual connection of the community to this physical fabric, then our efforts in really bringing back cultural heritage to its formal glory will not be effective.